Jessica, and thanks to the American Councils for bringing me out here. I'm thrilled to be able to spend two weeks in Central Asia talking about China and U.S.-China relations and the way that the world is responding uh, to China's growing power. I'm very pleased to be with all of you this afternoon. Uh, after my remarks, it doesn't just have to be Q&A. Uh, there's a lot of expertise in the room, and so comments and your views are also welcome. I hope that you'll participate. I was interested to see that Kazakhstan, like the United States, you all fill in at the back to be as far as possible from the professor first and then only when forced to come up front. That's what we do in the United States too, in both classrooms and in churches, if it's working that way. Um, so I want to talk about U.S.-China relations, uh, where they are and what that might mean uh, for third countries, including Kazakhstan. I'd like to begin, though, by saying that while a fair amount of what I'm going to be saying is uh, negative and somewhat pessimistic, uh, that I have, have not been a China hawk by any means. I have been a China engager. I went there first in 1987. I've lived there for about 12 years total and have gone very, very deep with the Chinese language, with Chinese friends, Chinese institutions, Chinese culture. And I have benefited terrifically by doing that. Uh, so I am not uh, anti-China. Uh, I'm actually uh, regarded as too moderate by many of my friends in Washington, although I imagine I might not sound that way to you today. Uh, things have changed. So I've structured my initial remarks uh, in three parts. I'm going to talk first about what I think is the right framework for understanding US-China relations. Then I want to talk about the foundation, the organizing principles for the U.S.-China relationship itself. And then spend uh, the last section briefly on implications of the changing nature of U.S.-China relations for other countries and for the world. Uh, because U.S.-China relations now uh, and navigating the competition between these two big powers is a major foreign policy priority for nearly every country. So that, that's the structure of things today, and then I would love to hear from all of you. So first, the framework for U.S.-China relations. I think that the most accurate and fruitful way to understand this relationship now is that the United States and China are already engaged in a new kind of Cold War. I think that this is a Cold War. There's been a discussion, it's ongoing, in the United States for several years about whether Cold War is a good analogy, a useful way to speak about U.S.-China relations. Like many of my colleagues, I had resisted using this phrase uh, for quite a few of the last five or six years, but at this time last year, I was asked to write an art, a, a reading essay for the Bullets of the Atomic Scientists, and they asked me to take on the question of whether it was a Cold War, and so I, I went through and I, I looked at what seemed to me to be the right criteria and ended up uh, convinced that actually that was correct and that was the right way to look at it. But I, I came to that conclusion uh, regretfully. And there were, uh, there were two reasons that a lot of my colleagues continue to say we should not call this a Cold War. And these are serious objections to calling it a Cold War, so I'm going to go over those. Uh, the first objection that you hear most in the United States is that this is not a Cold War because during the first Cold War, the Soviet Union was not a full peer competitor of the United States. It was a large military power because of its nuclear arsenal, and it was able to use its military power to become a political power within a limited sphere, but it was never a global economic rival to the United States. It was never a rival technologically or even in soft power or cultural terms. And so the objection is, don't, don't call this a new Cold War, because if you call it a Cold War, Washington will default to the strategies that it used, in its view, successfully during the first Cold War. And they will not be adequate, because China is a much more formidable rival. China really is an American peer in the economic sphere, in the technological sphere, to some degree uh, in the ideational sphere, and politically and militarily. So that's one objection to calling it a Cold War. The second, which is somewhat related, is that during the first Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union were not integrated with each other. 
uh, they were lived largely in alienation from each other, whereas the United States and China are highly integrated, especially economically. Despite the trade war launched in 2018, and those tariffs are still in place, our trade volume with China is at an all-time high. So there's a large degree of mutual independence. This is something new. What does it mean to be in uh, what the Biden administration calls an extreme competition with a country that you're closely integrated with economically? And so again, the criticism is, don't say Cold War. This is such a different case that the old kinds of strategies and tactics don't apply. And then I think the third reason that you don't hear as often uh, that prevents some people from calling this a Cold War is that it's depressing. It's depressing to find ourselves back in the Cold War. We thought that we had moved beyond this. It seems retrograde uh, to be back in that kind of intense long-term rivalry. Uh, but I believe that that is where we find ourselves. Why do I say that? The United States and China are competing worldwide in every region, in outer space, and in cyberspace to be the most influential country on Earth. Now, both, both Beijing and Washington know that neither is going to have the kind of uncontested power or preeminence that the United States had sort of at the end of the Cold War. It's not going to be a unipolar world. I think both Beijing and Washington understand that. But we're competing to be the most influential nation uh, in terms of security architectures, trade, financial, and economic regimes. Very importantly, we're competing ferociously to be the leading developer uh, of new technology and to lead in marketization of new technology and international regulation of new technology. This is a new sphere. We are competing to shape global norms and practices, and therefore we're also competing to shape the values that underlie those norms and practices. We're competing to shape global order, and there's an ideological piece. We are doing so against the background of extreme distrust in which we are trying not only to compete by doing as well as we possibly can, we are also trying to kneecap the other guy. That's, a, that's a big and obscure English phrase. Um, it, we're competing not only to do well, but to limit the other country's ability to do well. Now, that kind of competition alone doesn't necessarily make this a cold war. But there are other changes. One is in public opinion. Uh, we now have about 90% people in the United States and China who have a primarily negative view of the other country. That's, that's new. The Chinese, for most of the past several decades, have, have not been anti-American. I've, I've lived among them and they've been uh, wonderful hosts and extremely diplomatic. And I say many of them are good friends. And Americans, too, have not been primarily anti-Chinese. It's never been a smooth relationship. But we've been very welcoming uh, of each other at the individual and the community level. Because of this distrust, and in part because of COVID, the United States and China are now, for the first time since 1989, alienated, or 79, alienated from each other. Not as many students are traveling. We don't have as many tourists, companies, non-governmental organizations, not as many journalists. We're not involved with each other. And in part as a, as a result of that, and this is a very Cold War kind of feature, Hostility to the other country has become an organizing principle of government in both Beijing and Washington. So that now in Congress we have a standing committee of United States competition with the Chinese Communist Party. We have the China mission in the CIA. We have the China House in the State Department. This is all new. And China is similarly organizing government for long-term rivalry. The United States and China also face a real security dilemma in the Western Pacific. In the Western Pacific, we have incommensurate, means we cannot reconcile or compromise ideas about what a, a fair and workable security architecture would look like. We also have a, a new nuclear arms race as China starts to build rapidly toward parity with the United States. And as the United States tries to figure out what a nuclear deterrence doctrine would look like when we have three players instead of two players, as we had during 
first Cold War. Again, this is starting to sound pretty Cold War-ish. Uh, perhaps most importantly, we're beginning to see the development of mutually exclusive systems in the technology and financial realms. Beijing and Washington understand that other countries do not want to choose between two large camps. This is understood. It is not in Kazakhstan's interest to choose a Chinese camp or a Chinese-Russian camp or an American camp. Uh, many European countries, many allies also don't want to choose. And Beijing and Washington, our diplomats are very careful to say, uh, we don't, you know, we're not forcing you to choose. The last part of that is we would be delighted if you did in an unforced way, but we're not forcing you to choose. But when you get mutually exclusive global telecommunication systems, for example, 5G, then you may have to choose one or the other. We are beginning to see mutually exclusive financial systems. China is developing its SIPS, C -I -P -S, system as a rival to the SWIFT system for interbank transfers. Again, mutually exclusive, these can force choices. Both China and the United States, furthermore, are strengthening up their partnerships and alliances. China has no formal alliances, but it has greatly strengthened its partnership primarily with Russia, but also with Iran, uh, North Korea still, Cuba, uh, to some degree now Saudi Arabia. We're beginning to see the formation of something like blocks. Some Chinese analysts have begun to speak of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as a balancer to NATO. And the United States, too, is strengthening its alliances deliberately to counter China. Uh, it has been involved in convincing NATO that it should see itself as having a China mission. And then there, there, there is, it has been, for, it's been true for two or three years, there are no bright spots in U.S.-China relations. There's no area in which we can cooperate and build the capacity to work together and apply that to other areas. Okay? We, we have failed, um, I don't know if this is a fantasy people are familiar with here, but the alien invasion test. We failed it twice. And the alien invasion test is, you know, these, the big countries are fighting and aliens come from outer space and we realize that we're all citizens of Earth and we have to protect ourselves, so we band together to fight the aliens, right? Well, we failed to do that with the pandemic, and we are failing to do that with global warming. We're failing that test. And everything that I just said, these Cold War factors, all of this was true before Russia invaded Ukraine and China supported Russia. This was all true before the United States put in place export controls, which are designed to weaken China's development of semiconductors, a very Cold War move. So I think it's a Cold War. That's, I think, the right framing. It's going to be very dangerous, very expensive. It will last for several de decades, and it is going to be sinfully wasteful. We are going to face new kinds of guns and butter trade-offs, but I think that that's where we are. Second part, the foundation of U.S.-China relations. What is this relationship about? I'll go through this history fairly quickly. You may be familiar with it. When we established relations uh, with China in 1979, Richard Nixon went to Beijing to meet Mao Zedong first in 1972. It was Jimmy Carter in 1979 and Deng Xiaoping who actually established diplomatic relations. We did that in order to balance against the Soviet Union. That was the rationale and the organizing principle for the relationship. After the Soviet Union uh, fell apart in 1991, China and the United States never sat down and said, okay, that rationale, that foundation for the relationship is gone. What is this relationship about now? We, we never really asked that question. In retrospect, though, we can see that uh, beginning in the 90s, U.S.-China relations were about uh, three things. One was the development of China, human flourishing, the, the, the improvements in the economic life of you know, one point, at that point, two million people, uh, one, now 1.4 billion people. The United States made enormous contributions to China's development during those several decades. So developing China was one goal. Number two, of course, was 
making money while we did this. American profits were always a major uh, motivating force. And then number three, the idea was through working closely with China and by co-evolving, evolving together with China, the United States and other countries would introduce China, usher China into the existing global system. So that as China got wealthier, it would see itself as a stakeholder in that system, as benefiting from that system, and would then contribute to the system rather than trying to change it radically. So those were the goals of the relationship, although they were never really articulated or stated in that way at the time. They were somewhat taken for granted. Uh, when the George W., the second Bush administration, came, uh, came into the White House in 2001, George W. Bush was questioning this goal of engagement with China. He came in saying that you know, his team was the blue team and they were going to take on the red team or the panda huggers, the Americans who were, who were too soft on China. Uh, it was George W. Bush who first said, he was asked at a press conference, is China a friend or an enemy? And he said, neither, it's a strategic competitor. That was Bush language. And he was also asked early in his administration uh, what he was willing to do to defend Taiwan from China. And he said, whatever it takes. Uh, and this was really a, a big change in the so-called One China policy. So Bush came in ready to rethink the relationship. But then we had the 9-11 attacks. And America and China sort of took a 10-year break from each other while we focused on the Middle East and China focused on economic development. Today, I think we're faced with the question of whether these two countries, China and the United States, want a relationship with each other at all. If you listen to the rhetoric coming out of both capitals, it doesn't sound like we really want a relationship. A growing number of members of Congress um, say that China is an existential threat to the United States. Uh, it is not an existential threat. This is, this is extremely unhelpful, uh, exaggerated language, but that view uh, is spreading. Uh, when Michael Pompeo was the Secretary of State, he essentially called on the Chinese people to rise up and overthrow their government uh, in a speech in 2020 at the, the Nixon Library. China's statements are that the United States is a declining power, that the East is rising, and the West is failing, and their statements about the United States say that it is a corrupt and deluded nation that is clinging to the belief that it's still the world number one, and that that belief makes it dangerous. So it's really equal on both sides. I hope you realize that I haven't blamed either side for this state of affairs, that there are concerns on both sides of that. So do we want a relationship at all? If we do, what is the foundation of that? What is the organizing principle or the main idea of the relationship? And I believe that the, the new foundation, and I really mean the foundation, not just a slogan, the organizing principle of the relationship must be not to go to war. It's about the avoidance of war. The United States and China must not go to war with each other. Uh, it would be destructive on a scale that we cannot begin to anticipate. We don't understand the escalation risks. Stating that our goal is to avoid war is not to wish away the problem. I say that acknowledging that the risk of war has gone up, continues to go up, and that the state of, relationship, of the relationship is quite dire. And I think it needs to be that, the avoidance of war, by which we measure our major policy initiatives. There are some in Washington who would say that our main goal is to overthrow the Chinese Communist Party. That's not the goal. The goal is to avoid war, no matter how concerned we are about aspects of the Chinese Communist Party. Others, um, perhaps people closer to the Biden administration, would say that the goal is to prevail in contests, to win competitions with China. I think that we do need to compete very hard with China, but the goal is not to win competitions. Again, the goal is, not, is to avoid war. Why, why do I say that? If we look back at U.S.-China relations over at least the, since the beginning of the Trump administration, uh, but I really date it back to 2016, the, the big change in the United States views really comes in 2016 when China builds man-made islands in the South China Sea 
militarizes those islands, and then ignores the permanent court of arbitration when it says that China's territorial claims in the South China Sea have no legal basis. And China, China ignored that. I think it was that that really got America's attention. But it's under Trump, with Trump's rhetoric and the trade war, that we kick into an even more hostile state of affairs. And since that time, the United States and China have been complaining about each other in a whole series of issue areas. China has a long list of complaints about the United States. We have a long list of complaints about China that you're probably familiar with. Human rights, Xinjiang, Tibet, Hong Kong, uh, China's support for state-owned enterprises, China's intellectual property theft, there's a whole list of these. Both, both sides have a whole list of issue areas. And our policy has been mostly to be as loud about our complaints as we could possibly be. To, to keep it uh, telling the world all the things we object to about each other. And since this approach to policy began, the relationship has become worse and worse and worse. Um, almost by the month, and in ways that we hadn't foreseen uh, you know, the month before. The relationship has become much worse and is characterized by extreme antagonism and distrust. If, instead of making the relationship about our complaints in individual issue areas, if instead of doing that, we say the goal is to avoid war, then the first question you have to ask is, how can we create conditions that are conducive to peace? This is not the question in Washington or Beijing, I'll tell you right now. That's not the question that's being asked. How do we create conditions that are conducive to peace? And that question leads to questions about compromise, cooperation, adjustment, and perhaps, although it's a forbidden word, accommodation. How can we accommodate each other's interests? And again, these questions are not being asked in either capital. I think that's the direction that we need to take, but it requires both countries to acknowledge how bad the relationship has become. And neither is willing to do that. China says, this is not a fundamentally competitive relationship. That is the wrong way to look at it. The key has to be cooperation. That, I think, is a not only grossly simplistic, but just simply inaccurate description of the nature of the relationship, which China knows well to be competitive. The Biden administration's senior officials, when they talk about China, they tend to lead off by saying, of course we don't want a Cold War with China. And then they proceed to describe what is, in essence, a Cold War. There's a hesitancy in both capitals to acknowledge how bad things have become. And in both Beijing and Washington, People are a little bit too cavalier or casual in their descriptions of possibilities for conflict. And whether it is a conventional conflict, a nuclear conflict, a cyber conflict, it would be something new. And it would be a conflict that we don't understand very well. We don't know what the escalation ladder is, the kinds of decisions that make these conflicts more and more dangerous. So I think we need to recognize how bad things are in order to commit to avoiding war. Uh, some in Beijing and Washington uh, think this cannot happen unless we have a crystallizing crisis, uh, something like the Cuban Missile Crisis, which forced Russia and the United States to first believe in the possibility of, nucle of nuclear warfare and then to fight against it. We had to come very, very close before we started to work together on things like arms control. The United States and China are not there yet. They are simply talking past each other. And so I think that we need somehow, if we can't get there through the wisdom of leadership, then it may take something like a crisis, which by definition we, we, would, we might not be able to control. But it's a dire set of circumstances. And then lastly and very quickly, and less pessimistically, Obviously, this new Cold War uh, will not be like the old Cold War in a number of ways. Uh, one, one is that we face a number of crises simultaneously. U.S.-China relations, managing that, is our greatest geostrategic challenge. But our greatest geostrategic challenge may not be the greatest challenge we face overall. We face challenges from global warming, the globalization of disease, of crime, information, 
of human flows, the globalization of problems that can be attributed to very unequal development. Face all of that at the same time as global warming, and at the same time that we see a confluence of new technologies uh, that we don't understand individually, <clears throat> much less do we understand the meaning for all of us of the confluence of these new technologies. So both the United States and China are going to have limited resources and attention to pay to the Cold War because they're going to have to pay attention to some of these transnational problems. Also, the United States and China both faced tremendous domestic problems, a big, big to-do list for Biden and Xi Jinping, and both countries face tremendous domestic fragility for different reasons. Uh, the United States is badly polarized politically. This is a major source of, of fragility in the United States. China is facing a uh, secular slowdown in its economy as, as its foreign relations get worse and it becomes more isolated. And as China's demographic crisis, its shrinking and aging population, hits home about 10 years earlier than they expected. So both Beijing and Washington will have limited resources for their rivalry because they will be distracted domestically. And then lastly and most importantly is the multinational context, which is very different than the first Cold War. I think the biggest mistake we can make when talking about the United States and China is to speak as if they're the only two powers in the world. When you speak that way, it's very hard to avoid the conclusion that we're headed for conflict. But unlike during the decades of the first Cold War, the sources of power and the dispersal of power is much, much greater in today's world. Corporations, non-governmental organizations, universities, media outlets, individual bloggers all have far more influence worldwide than they did during the first Cold War. And middle powers and smaller countries all have far greater agency and influence than they had during the first Cold War. And I think that one of the greatest keys to getting through this Cold War and keeping it cold will be for third countries to exercise that agency and that, 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 that power. And so what that means is that instead of, as many countries in Europe and, and Asia that I work with closely do, instead of wondering what is China going to do to us, what is the United States going to do to us, you have to figure out what your own interests are and stand up to both China and the United States, or China and the United States and Russia. I think it's in you know, multinational organizations, mid-level powers, and also smaller countries, exercising their agency, that multilateral context, is probably our best hope for peace. And I will stop there, and I really look forward to questions, but also comments, disagreements. I would love to hear what Kazakhstan makes of these difficulties. You, you have a, a very important, very particular viewpoint, and I'm here to listen to that. And so why don't I uh, stop and open it up, and uh, so can I sit down? Have more of a talk? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Red is on? I'm on. Okay, so, um, Anybody, as I say, I know there's a lot of, uh, many students here, many faculty members. I'd, I'd love to hear uh, from any of you. That is a disappointment. How dull. Wow. Okay. Is this better? Okay, so I'm American, unfortunately. Um, so you're not going to get a Cossack perspective on this, but I'm interested in how you would characterize um, the reaction in Washington or the conversation and discourse in Washington on the decline of U.S. hegemony, um, because I think that that's a huge factor in not only U.S. Um, China relations but also U.S. Russia relations. Uh, and I'm curious to see if like is how is that being discussed in Washington? Is is there meaningful, like, what is the post of U.S. hegemony for the First, U.S.? Sure. No, very important question. First, Washington doesn't use the word hegemony to describe its own power or influence. This, uh, I, I think the State Department actually has something close to a formal ban 
on using the word. Uh, I didn't start to hear it used regularly until six or seven years ago. Although many Americans unofficially do use it and use it in the sense that other countries, China and Russia use to criticize the United States. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. It's really, your question I think is about decline and how that is looked at. Uh, it's widely written about in the United States, uh, as you probably know, if you read foreign affairs journals or even some of the better newspapers, it's an almost constant question. Is the United States uh, declining uh, in relative terms, in absolute terms? Is it declining not at all? Uh, there's there's a, a pretty lively discourse on it. I, I would say that among the foreign affairs experts, it's broadly accepted that with the rise of the rest, as other countries develop, America's relative power is going to go down, even if it's in absolute terms, the indices of power actually go up. And I think that that's pretty, pretty widely accepted. And it's not just a question of the rise of the rest. It's also a question of the equitable distribution of resources. There's been a lot of work done on this, but it, you know, if, if the whole world's material life was like that of middle-class Americans, then depending on the estimate, you need five to 10 Earth's worth of natural resources to support that. And something has got to give. The, the only way out of that problem is to invoke the technology genie and to say that technology uh, will always save us. Uh, but I think that there's, there's acceptance that America's power is going to decline. Uh, I think that there's quite a bit of uh, very deep fear about that. And I think this is one of the reasons that America tends to emphasize an international rules-based order. This is why we tend to focus on the global order and can we put in place transparent rules understood within a body of international law that create an environment that we're all happy operating in regardless of relative power balances. I think that that's, these concerns are one of the things that feed the global order, rules-based order discourse. But it's something that politicians don't speak about. Uh, I don't think that I've heard any, and correct me, other Americans or foreign observers in the room, I don't think that I've heard any politician who's still in office talk in a serious way about what, even what America's relative decline might mean for Americans, because you simply can't say, you know, vote for me and I'll shepherd you into being, you know, relatively poorer and less influential. It's not a good political slogan. I'm also an American citizen, but what is more disappointing is- You guys need to shout down. What, These obnoxious Americans. What is, what is more disappointing is that I'm an economist. <laughs> and what that, what that implies, among other things, is that 10 years ago, 2012, the retail sector in China was worth $1.8 trillion. And the U.S. trade the retail sector was worth $4 trillion. In 2022, the Chinese retail sector is worth six trillion, or was worth six trillion, and the U.S. retail sector worth five point five trillion. This is not a relative decline. This is an absolute decline. It's not a decline. Both have risen, but China has become bigger in this particular sense. Not only that, two thousand sixteen was a critical year in which, if you measure the GDP of China and measure the GDP of the United States, and same prices which we call purchasing power parity, PPP. Then that's when the American and the Chinese GDP became equal. And subsequently, the Chinese GDP has grown faster and is now bigger than the US GDP in PPP, not at current prices. At current prices, we are at 25 trillion, we are at 18 trillion, and the European Union is 17 trillion, and Russia, 1.8 trillion. So Russia is a poor country by international standards, but a giant in terms of military power. China, on the other hand, has already become a great, not a, peer, not a mere peer competitor, not only a rising great power, but a risen great power. They have risen. So the issue is no longer whether there will be conflict. There is competition. Don't worry, take another index. Ford Motor Company sells more cars in China than the US, Canada, and Mexico put together. So there are, and as, as, as Robert currently pointed out, with the Soviet Union, they were never entrenched. 
we were never enmeshed economically, culturally, socially. With China, we are trade-wise extremely entrenched. So that separation is going to be costly for both countries, and that has already started. Decoupling. You mean. Decoupling yeah. has already started. The Chinese has started. In the last two months, there's been a decline in the number of GM and Ford cars sold in China by double digits. So this decoupling has already started, and it's a mega trend. It's not really a matter of can we guide it this way or that way. This is just the way it goes. John Mearsheimer is quite articulate on. Uh, John, John Mearsheimer is very articulate for a man who's frequently wrong. <laughs> Well, on the other hand, he takes the emotion and feelings out of it, and he says, what if there were great powers driven by rational interest and the desire for survival, and they did not know the other party's intentions, how would they act? Right. And from those axioms appears his, appear his conclusions. So my question to you is the following. Is it really a choice that we have and the Chinese have, or is it an inevitability that this conflict will sharpen? Hmm. Well, the, and, and the, well, this is one of the reasons that I was took great pains not to blame either side. Well, I'm not blaming in my, No, I know you're not. I know, but I'm saying that this yeah. is, um, I think that a, a, quite a bit of this is a structural historical development that was going to come in some form or another once China succeeded in its development. I think that both countries have made some specific uh, errors or decisions that made things worse, but I think that in the main, some version of this was coming. Uh, what China is trying to figure out right now is, you know, they, they have all this wealth. What is the relationship between wealth and power? Many Chinese speak as if, okay, if our GDP reaches America, America should just hand over the keys to the car to be the primary country in the global system. Well, that's not the way that that works. You know, there are, there are other forms of power and influence. Uh, Dr. Kissinger, and I, I worked for the Kissinger Institute, but I'm, I'm not a Kissinger acolyte, but I think he's right about this. He says that for any order, set of rules, way of doing things, to be workable, it has to have both power and legitimacy. So it has to be able to enforce norms, but the norms also have to be seen as legitimate as working more or less for everybody within the system. So China is figuring out how to translate wealth into hard power and certain kinds of influence. It's having less success with the legitimacy piece. And this is going to be a, a long drawn out process during which China itself will continue to change. The story of modern China is a story of extremely rapid change on a massive scale. And that remains true. And the United States is, is, is facing changes as well. So yes, China is already, it has the world's largest consumer class. What follows from that? Well, we don't know. It, it gets negotiated day to day in very complicated ways, but it's not gonna be a handing over of the keys. Um, good evening. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Robert, for your speech. Very informative. And I, my name is Mika, so I'm from Tajikistan. So basically, my question would be from the perspective of uh, Central Asian countries Can and countries. Oh, yes. Is it okay now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Mika, and I'm from Tajikistan. Therefore, my question would be more of a from the perspective of Central Asian countries and basically the countries of third, uh, the third countries. Um, you, at the end, you said that we should avoid the fact that it's just a game of two countries. There are also third countries should um, that should uh, use their power to raise up, right? So you said that nowadays, um, despite the the previous Cold War, nowadays the uh, communities like universities and um, individual bloggers have more effect uh, impact than they had before. So maybe could you give us this more specific ways, the ways that we can use our power and I don't know, maybe raise awareness of what should we can do the uh, communities with less power. And, and where, did you, where did you say you're from? Did you, did you okay, that's that? what I thought you said. Um, well, so I hear, without wanting to betray any confidences, I had a number of very interesting conversations today uh, with mostly Kazakhs, but others who are you know, from the region about China. And for the various reasons that, that people are, are somewhat more dependent on China economically. They're more involved in the Shanghai cooperation 
organization. Uh, there's a, something of a slight tilt toward China relative to Russia. Uh, but there's still a desire to be more involved with Europe, more involved, you know, with the United States. And at the same time, I've also heard a lot of concern about China, uh, concern about uh, being overrun or having China, um, you know, uh, be the one that exploits natural resources. There, there are a number of concerns about China. And all I mean is that I think it's important to be as frank with China about your concerns as, I, I don't know about the Kazakh case here, but in general, uh, most of the countries in South America, many of the countries in Africa, Europe, and Asia, they're pretty frank with the United States about their concerns about the United States. They speak openly to Americans because most Americans, not all, not all, um, will allow that. They'll, they'll listen to that. And um, Americans can be arrogant and self-interested, but they can also be self-critical and introspective. Uh, so you tend to speak as openly to Americans as you can, namely very openly, and also to speak to China as openly as you can, namely not openly at all. Right, with, with, and, and what that does is it, it tends to reinforce the Chinese Communist Party's sense that there are only problems with America and that there aren't problems, you know, with China. And I, I think it's just in general a, a case of being as frank with all the great powers uh, as you, as you are with each of them individually to create a kind of balance and to find strategic space for yourself. I do not think it will work for you, you know, if if you're frank with Americans and Europeans and, and more passive vis-a-vis -vis Russia and China. I see where that goes. Obviously, you have to pick your battles. You don't just go around annoying great powers for no reason, but I think that it's important to be frank. And there are a number of people who write about these issues uh, who I think are guilty of making uh, the same mistake. I'm thinking about somebody like Kishore Mabubani, who writes a lot about Chinese power. And he's a Singaporean. Uh, and he's, I've met with him a number of times. I like him personally. But he tends to always compare the best thing you can possibly say about China to the worst thing you can possibly say about the United States. That's his fundamental intellectual move. And it's disingenuous and unworthy of respect, even though his criticisms of the United States tend to be legitimate. They're, they're, they're real criticisms of the United States, but they're compared to the best that China can do. And I just think that... For, for in your country's diplomacy and Tajikistan's diplomacy, it's important to make sure that you stick up for your own interests. That, that's really all I mean by that. I, there's no one magic formula or one move you need to make. I'm just speaking about a, a diplomatic disposition toward all of the great powers. Thank you so much. There is one issue here, though, that in great power politics, the views of smaller, <clears throat> less powerful countries really have no role to play. Well, wait. <clears throat> Lithuania, your, Lithuania has just played an enormous role in standing up it, to China. What they, has it achieved? They have changed Europe's mind. When Lithuania first pushed back, you know, Lithuania let Taiwan call their representative office in Vilnius the Taiwan representative office. China then proceeded to economically coerce Lithuania. The Europeans got very nervous about this because the big four German companies, Chrysler, BMW, Volkswagen and BASF all do a lot of business in China. And they tended to want to cut Lithuania out. Then China said that it would also not accept exports, re-exports from Lithuania to Europe to China. And it was a bridge too far. China started noticing that they had been coercing the Czech Republic, Sweden, Norway, in addition to Canada, Australia. And in fact, uh, European views toward China have hardened considerably. And it was Lithuania that was the mouse that war roared and that, that stood up. So there is agency there. You've got to be ready for China to hit back. China takes names. China will coerce. Uh, but if you persist, you can, you can make a difference. It's not cost-free. And you shouldn't do it in every case, right? Pick your battles, the ones that matter. There was, sorry, you had a... Yeah, thank you very much for explanation of this. Chinese behavior as well. Uh, if everyone indicates like citizenship, I'm Kazakh citizen. And uh, I have a question, which is, I think, in the air. 
The United States supports Ukraine when Russia invaded Ukraine, yes? And we have huge fear that Russia can invade over here as well. Uh, you started to support Ukraine kind of after three months of their <clears throat> really heroic resistance. What shall, can you comment about, about all of the situation? Because Russia with the like dictator in office, with some kind of uh, imperial trau traumatic condition and so on and so on. We are really in this modern Kazakhstan issue and so on and so on. In Kazakhstan, everyone is thinking about it absolutely seriously. Uh, and uh, Ukraine is, whatever we say, it's Europe, yes? Mm -hmm. Kazakhstan is here, China next door. Uh, US, can you, what you gonna do in this case? Right, thank you so, very much. Russia moves against Northern Kazakhstan with their majority Russian speakers. What does the United States do? So first there is, there is a will, will you wait another three months again as in Ukraine? <laughs> Well, was it really? Was it really? It was not really wait three months. Okay. We were actually providing intelligence to Ukraine even before the invasion, from about 2014 onwards, at least, at least from the time of the capital. So I, I, I take the, the, the thrust of your question. I, I I understand, and of course, there's been a lot of criticism of the United States in Europe, uh, from Africa, especially Latin America, other places. Uh, that say, you know, Europe thinks that its problems are the whole world's problems, but it doesn't think that the whole world's problems mm -hmm. are Europe's problems. Um, an even more brutal way of putting it is, you know, America and Europe went to help another European or another white nation. Would they help another, would they help a non-white nation with all the violence and the slaughters in Africa? How come there isn't, you know, as much concern? Um, I think those are obviously very fair questions. You can't avoid these questions. Part of the answer is that uh, in many of the African cases, America's interests were not as directly involved as they are, as a matter of fact, in Ukraine. There, there are more direct American influences uh, that are involved. Um, it, I think it also helped in the case of Ukraine that the Ukrainian military itself was so effective, more effective than we thought they would be, which I think helped us to want to help them. But in one sense, your question is a little bit too hypothetical, but I think part of the answer is that if you really think that that is a risk, and I'm not qualified to say whether that's a risk or not, um, you want America and Europe to know you, to, to, to know Kazakhstan, to feel a stake of, you know, of involvement and of common cause, because we didn't go into Ukraine because of some abstract idea, just that you, you in one country invaded another. It was that this specific country, Russia, about which we have specific interests and fears, invaded this other country that invoked specific interests and a country that we knew. Uh, and so I think that if you think this is a real issue, then you need to start talking with Americans now about our vital interests in Kazakhstan. And we have to do more to make sure that Americans and Kazakhs know each other so there's some sense of common feeling. They would not respond in the abstract um, just because of a violation against sovereignty. I, I know that's an unsatisfactory answer. That's just all I got. Thank you very much. Now we have to formulate vital interests of the United States in the region, yes, in Kazakhstan. Uh, right. Okay, thank you. Anything else, including disagreements? Yes, sir. Oh, I'm also from Kazakhstan. Uh, so you know that uh, our president Akayev has given the order to create a you know, concept of foreign policy. Concept of foreign policy. Mm -hmm. It was uh, happened a few days ago. Uh, could you imagine, for example, you are Kazakh citizenship. What you will what based on your experience, what you will recommend uh, uh, in the field of developing a relation between Kazakhstan and China? What do I think about the what, what no, you can imagine? In, for in, example, you are you are one Kazakh researcher, right. so that was preparing the concept of foreign policy new of our country. Well, I, so I, what I, will be your suggestions, recommendation for this one? This is my third based on your experience. I, I understand the question. This is this is my third day in Kazakhstan ever. And you know, there's nothing worse than Americans who don't know anything 
coming into strange countries and telling them what to do. Uh, so I, I really don't want to suggest, you know, that I have the, the depth of knowledge to answer that. What I, what I can tell you is that Washington understands, I think, pretty well the position that Kazakhstan is in by virtue of its geography, its history, uh, its developmental status. And so Washington is not and will not ask Kazakhstan to ignore your interests vis-a-vis -vis Russia or to ignore your growing interests vis-a-vis -vis China. Those things are, are, are real and, and lasting and, and part of your geography and, and, and what you are. So I think you can be sure that Washington understands you know, Kazakhstan's conditions. Uh, but that's all I would want to say. Again, I, I, Americans are much too quick to run around the world telling people what they ought to do. Good luck. <laughs> You mentioned earlier in the uh, in your lecture that <coughs> Chinese and American hate each other. I don't believe I said anything of the kind. I said that negative perceptions are a historic high. That is not at all the same as saying that they hate each other. Right. I, I agree. Um, Fifteen years ago, what we have this is we deal with the Chinese all the time. Fifteen years ago, the Chinese citizens, the tourists, were very polite. Now they're not. So we, we do not accept any Chinese people in any of our groups. They are. Isn't that illegal in the Philippines? As the, the government has grown more powerful, it seems that the people also have become more aggressive. And I'm just wondering what the U.S. thinks the what the solution to this is. Because in the U.S., the government kind of represents the people. Kind of. I mean, yes, we are the economists and you know, red, blue, whatever. But in China, I guess that's in Russia. The leaders try to do what they want, but the, the people seem to be following the, the Chinese model, you know, and, and they are very aggressive you know, in um, you know, Southeast Asia. And recently, you know, that uh, the U.S. government signed an agreement militarily with four more ba access to four more Philippine bases. Right, and Subic and, and other places. And one of those is close to where I am. And uh, we're pretty really happy. So I think hasn't the Philippines said that the United States could not store forces in these bases which would be used in a Taiwan contingency? I'm not sure okay. recently. Yeah, they've so they've clarified that. Yeah, but we have Guam. Right. So I, I have not noticed any change in the behavior of, of, of Chinese in the United States. There is a, uh, a discourse within China itself. You know, we used to have this phrase, the ugly American, about Americans going all around the world and having no real empathy with other people and being sort of boorish and loud and self-insistent. And there has, for about five years in China, been a lot of warnings by Chinese saying too many of us are behaving as ugly Chinese. So, but they're self-critical. It's a Chinese discourse about this. Chinese themselves uh, have been warning about this. And so I, I don't want to reify any of that. I haven't, uh, I haven't run into any of that. I understand, obviously, you know, it's easy to understand the Philippines' concerns when China's nine-dash line goes well into China's exclusive economic zone. And one of the things that's happening is exactly what foreign affairs theorists would predict, which is that as China's power has grown, other countries in its region have been balancing against it. And so the Philippines is now, after Duterte, leaning a little bit back toward the United States, albeit in a limited way. India is willing to go further than it had been previously in drawing close to the United States. Japan has said that a Taiwan contingency would involve its interests. And so this is classical foreign relations theory says there will be balancing and we're seeing balancing. 
Uh, China, I would just note, does adjust. It does notice these kinds of changes and China's foreign policy adjusts. It knows that, it, um, that there has been more opposition to Chinese power even on its doorstep. And we'll see what kinds of adjustments they make. Can they be less blatantly self-regarding? Can they soften some of their territorial claims? We'll, we'll wait and see. But the next thing we've noticed is that comparing the U.S. and China is China tends to be a good basic technology in more different ways. The U.S. does have some kind of what we call consensus right and wrong. In fact, in China, it's going to be the one that does as well. But, um, uh, for instance, China sends agents to the Palauans, which is where we are. The bag of money that we buy on the property is based on their military <laughs> bag of money, like three pieces of stuff. And I think China, you know, what this is doing around the world, but they're not necessarily dealing with the Europeans the same way they do with the third world. Countries. Right, that's very true. And uh, they're working their way into the third world countries uh, by recognizing needs with. Leaders who could be called dictators or some are elected, whatever, but who might not be as honest as government. It's called elite capture. That's the polite word, what you're talking about. And the uh, U.S. Doesn't, doesn't seem to know how to deal with it. Uh, what is the U.S. doing to prevent this? Well, we, there's not much we, if China's going to go in with bags of money and buy things legally or give money to corrupt officials in badly governed countries, there's not a whole lot we can do. Uh, we have the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which prevents American companies from giving bribes overseas. In some countries, that seems to work well for us. In others, it limits you know, some of the things that we can do. I think we need to be careful. I, I don't say this to you know, just to kick America, but a lot of the rest of the world is very aware of the less than benevolent moves the United States has also made. You know, after the over the past 75 years. So I, I think you're doing a little bit of the reverse, Kishore Mabubani. You're comparing the best things we can say about the US to the worst things we can say about China. You're flipping that script. And I think I think we need a somewhat more um, comprehensive view of, of the total impact of Chinese money. In many cases, a rising tide has lifted other boats. In other cases, there's corruption and there's self-interest. Uh, but I'm not sure that if we were having this conversation in front of an international audience, that they would stand up and clap for all the good things that you said about the United States and boo all the bad things you said about China. I think they would say that it's a mixed bag all around. And again, I'm not. This is the case. I'm just out of the region. Okay? I'm not, a, not necessarily pro American around the world, but I see what China is doing in the region where I live, and I see this as a problem. Yeah, I, I don't I don't disagree with that, but I don't have firsthand knowledge of it. So again, I don't I don't want to jump in too hard on that. There was a hand way, I saw something at the back. Yeah. Um let's have this be the last question. Um this has been a fascinating discussion. So you're the lucky last question. 